The term terrorist is an empty distinction, designed for any person or group who chooses to challenge the establishment. This isn't to be confused with the fictional Al-Qaeda, which was actually the name of a computer database for the US-supported Mujahideen in the 1980s. In 2007, the Department of Defense received $161.8 billion dollars for the so-called global war on terrorism. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, in 2004, roughly 2,000 people were killed internationally due to supposed terrorist acts. Of that number, 70 were American. Using this number as a general average, which is extremely generous, it is interesting to note that twice as many people die from peanut allergies a year than from terrorist acts. Concurrently, the leading cause of death in America is coronary heart disease, killing roughly 450,000 each year. And in 2007, the government's allocation of funds for research on this issue was about $3 billion. This means that the U.S. government in 2007 spent 54 times the amount for preventing terrorism than it spent for preventing a disease which kills 6,600 times more people annually than terrorism does. Yet, as the name terrorism and Al-Qaeda are arbitrarily stamped on every news report relating to any action taken against U.S. interests, the myth grows wider. In mid-2008, the U.S. Attorney General actually proposed that the U.S. Congress officially declare war against the fantasy. Not to mention, as of July 2008, there are now over one million people currently on the U.S. terrorist watch list. These so-called counterterrorism measures, of course, have nothing to do with social protection and everything to do with preserving the establishment amongst the growing anti-American sentiment both domestically and internationally, which is legitimately founded on the greed-based corporate empire expansion that is exploiting the world. The true terrorists of our world do not meet at the docks at midnight or scream Allah Akbar before some violent action. The true terrorists of our world wear $5,000 suits and work in the highest positions of finance, government, and business. So, what do we do? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that has so much power and momentum? How do we stop this aberrant group behavior which feels no compassion for, say, the millions slaughtered in Iraq and Afghanistan, so the corporatocracy can control energy resources and opium production for Wall Street profit? How do we stop a system of greed and corruption that condemns poor populations to sweatshop slavery for the benefit of Madison Avenue? Or that engineers false flag terror attacks for the sake of manipulation? Or that generates built-in modes of social operation which are inherently exploitative? Or that systematically reduces civil liberties and violates human rights in order to protect itself from its own shortcomings? How do we deal with the numerous covert institutions such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group, and other undemocratically elected groups which, behind closed doors, collude to control the political, 
financial, social, and environmental elements of our lives. In order to find the answer, we must first find the true underlying cause. For the fact is, the selfish, corrupt, power, and profit-based groups are not the true source of the problem. They are symptoms. My name is Jock Fresco. I'm an industrial designer and a social engineer. I'm very much interested in society in developing a system that might be sustainable for all people. First of all, the word corruption is a monetary invention. That aberrant behavior, behavior that's disruptive to the well-being of people, while you're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior appears to be environmentally determined, meaning if you were raised by the Seminole Indians as a baby, never saw anything else, you'd hold that value system. And this goes for nations, it goes for individuals, for families. They try to indoctrinate their children to their particular faith and their country and make them feel like they're part of that and they build a society which they call established. They establish a workable point of view and tend to perpetuate that, whereas all societies are really emergent, not established. And so they fight new ideas that would interfere with the establishment. Governments try to perpetuate that which keeps them in power. People are not elected to political office to change things. They're put there to keep things the way they are. So you see, the basis of corruption is in our society. Let me make it clear. All nations then are basically corrupt because they tend to uphold existing institutions. I don't mean to uphold or downgrade all nations, but communism, socialism, fascism, the free enterprise system, and all other subcultures are the same. They are all basically corrupt. The most fundamental characteristic of our social institutions is the necessity for self-preservation. Whether dealing with a corporation, a religion, or a government, the foremost interest is to preserve the institution itself. For instance, the last thing an oil company would ever want is the utilization of energy that was outside of its control, for it makes that company less relevant to society. Likewise, the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union was, in reality, a way to preserve and perpetuate the established economic and global hegemony of the United States. Similarly, religions condition people to feel guilty for natural inclinations, each claiming to offer the only path to forgiveness and salvation. At the heart of this institutional self-preservation lies the monetary system, for it is money that provides the means for power and survival. Therefore, just as a poor person might be forced to steal in order to survive, it is a natural inclination to do whatever is needed to continue an institution's profitability. This makes it inherently difficult for profit-based institutions to change, for it puts in jeopardy not only the survival of large groups of people, but also the coveted materialistic lifestyles associated with affluence and power. Therefore, the paralyzing necessity to preserve an institution, regardless of its social relevance, is largely rooted in the need for money or profit. What's in it for me is why people think. And so if a man makes money selling a certain product, naturally he's going to fight the existence of another product that may threaten his institution. Therefore, people cannot be fair. And people do not trust each other. A guy will come over to you and say, I got just the house you're looking for. He's a salesman. When a doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out, I don't know if he's trying to pay off a yacht or whether my kidney has to come out. It's hard in a monetary system 
to trust people. If you came into my store and I said, this lamp that I've got is pretty good, but the lamp of the next door is much better, I wouldn't be in business very long. It wouldn't work. If I were ethical, it wouldn't work. So when you say industry cares for people, that's not true. They can't afford to be ethical. So your system is not designed to serve the well-being of people. If you still don't understand that, there would be no outsourcing of jobs if they cared about people. Industry does not care. They only hire people because it hasn't been automated yet. So don't talk about decency and ethics. We cannot afford it and remain in business.